One of Nietzsche's most fascinating ideas, but also one of his most misunderstood ideas, is master and slave morality. Now, when people read this, they often take it and apply it to their own preferences, specifically ideologically. I'll meet a left winger and they will say, of course, I'm above the herd. I'm not like one of those backwards redneck Christians who just follow the slave morality of the church. I'm a free thinking liberal, you know, I'm a sophisticated, educated person. And then I'll talk to a reactionary right winger who will say, well, I'm not one of those libtard MPC slave moralists who just goes along with the regime, no matter what the situation is. I'm a free thinking master moralist. I bully grannies when they walk across the road. I am a puppy dog conqueror. I call people the untermensch. I am a chad. I hit the gym. Now, there's a little bit of truth and accuracy in both of these, but it comes along with an awful lot of inaccuracy and mistakes. So what I want to do is talk to you about the true meaning of master and slave morality. Now let's imagine ourselves in an American high school drama. And there is a jock. And let's think about the jock's experience of life. This is how we get inside the psychology of the winner of the master. So the jock's experience of life is quite effortless. It's quite intuitive and very instinctive because he is a well-made specimen of a human being. His mother was pretty, his father was handsome, he was well raised, they ate good foods, they had money, they did very, very well for themselves, so he turned out well. He was tall, he was broad-shouldered, he was beautiful, he was savvy and intelligent, he wasn't like nerdy intellectual, but he was an intuitively intelligent person. His whole experience of life has been quite effortless, he's always fitted in, he's always been good at sports, so the boys have always thought that he is cool, he's always got the girl quite easily because he was so popular, because he was so handsome, it was never that difficult for him to get girls. And for this reason, he has an awful lot of social confidence. He's very, very relaxed and chilled. He's a very nice, good guy. Now, this is very important. Think about how this guy psychologically experiences life. Think about how he relates to the emotions inside of his soul. You see, his soul is like all of our souls. It is motivated by the voices of life, the passions. And they want us to go and breed with a beautiful girl. They want us to go and put our genetic information into a beautiful woman so we can create children. Now when Chad, when the jock is walking through the high school experience and he sees Stacy, the gorgeous, beautiful girl, he feels an urge inside of himself. Life fills him full of energy and it makes him all tense and hot and heavy. And he's kind of saying, God damn, that Stacy girl's fine. She's hot. She's beautiful. Now, his experience when this voice, when this passion boils up inside of him is not something massively neurotic. It's not like he gets torn down. Like you often see people talk about being like, what do I do? What's going on? Instead, he is handsome. He's always been told that he's cool. He's always had very, very positive signals. He's always been rewarded for acting on impulse and trusting his gut. He is genuinely not at war with himself at all. So when he feels this passion, this desire for Stacy, he gets all hot and heavy and then he goes over and he talks to her. And because he's a specimen, because he's beautiful, because he's the right choice, Stacy loves him. Stacy doesn't give him ne negative feedback. Stacy doesn't try slap him on the nose or something like that and say, don't dare talk to me, you fucking loser, you dork. Instead, Stacy rewards him with love, with attraction. And in fact, his experience is that he feels that tension and that passion. And when he is the bravery to go and act in that passion, he gets rewarded with the pleasure of success. And this pleasure can be so high that he can have the pleasure of orgasm. Life can reward him in the ultimate way and say, you've managed to do the job that I want you to do. You've passed on your DNA into a beautiful woman. Yes, 10 out of 10, we have won. There you go, have a nice big run of an orgasm through your body. This is how a winner experiences his passions and his emotions. He really trusts them. He usually succeeds very instinctively because he's a specimen. And so he's not really at war with himself that much. Now, this can lead to an awful lot of bad things, as Nietzsche talked about. This means that the winner, the master, could be a little bit shallow and naive and out of touch with the way that the world works. But it also leads to many, many profound good things. Of course, the fact that he is a specimen in and of itself, and also this courageous and effortless way of acting on instinct, this animal magnetism that this type of character gets. But let's talk about the opposite. Now think about another character in this high school drama, the nerd. This is the guy who was not well turned out. 
This is the guy who had an unfortunate upbringing. His mother smoked cigarettes when he was in the womb, and so his bones were a little bit more frail. His father was never educated on how nutrition works, so he fed him a bad diet full of industrialized seed oils. And for this reason, his nose was always blocked, so he became a, a mouth breather, and he developed a dorky-looking face as a consequence. His, he became a chin cell. His neck stuck forward. He is ugly, he is frail, and he is small. When he went into school, he couldn't see properly. He's genetically botched because of all these allergies and because of this, these bad habits that his parents had. And so he was a little bit of a nasal nerd, stuck there in the back of class with his dorky glasses. He's not really able to play sports because he has asthma attacks and stuff like this. And for this reason, he struggles to make friends. And because of that, he's not very popular. So he has to kind of sit inside where everybody else plays sports. All the jocks are outside, you know, high-fiving each other and throwing balls around. He's busy in the classroom sitting down, you know, reading through books or something like this. Is the only thing he's good at, sticking his neck forward, being a pencil neck. And then this becomes a very big problem for him as he gets older and Stacy starts to show up and he starts to realize, he starts to feel those urges that Chad felt, that the jock felt, but he cannot fulfill them. Now, compare the psychology of the nerd to the Chad, and the psychology is about understanding how we relate to our soul. It is the logic of our soul. That's the meaning of that word. Did you not know? Now, the nerd is completely the opposite. The nerd is botched. The nerd has been badly raised. He is a genetic abomination. He struggles in every way. And as a consequence, he does not get the things that he wants. Stacy does not love him. He is unpopular, he is ugly, he is weak, he is frail, he is not charismatic because he has no social skills. And so when he feels a desire, when he feels that energy boiling up inside of him to be with Stacy, because Stacy's beautiful, of course, it does not get fulfilled. He maybe walks up to her and tries to talk to her in the lunch line holding his little tray. And she's like, oh my God, get away from me. And then like Chad, I don't know, the jock throws like a, a, a burger bun at him or something like that. It's like, get away from my girlfriend, man. Shut up, you nerd, dork, loser, or whatever, geek, <laughs> and whatever it is. And so he gets punished by life. Life around him, when he feels that desire to be with Stacy, life around him just launches on top of that and says, you can't have her. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. Put that emotion down. You will not be able to feel the release of that emotion. That emotion is getting castrated inside of you. You are a dork. Sit the fuck down. You're not getting what you want. Now, this is very important. This is the crux of understanding this, is how the master, how the winner experiences his emotions versus how the loser experiences his emotions, how he experiences these internal feelings. The nerd has a passion shoot up. Unlike the jock, he cannot release it. He cannot let it go and let the energy flow, which is how our emotions are supposed to work. And for this reason, it gets stuck inside of him. But there is an eternal law about our passions, the law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. So energy, passions that explode inside of us, don't just stop, don't just disappear. They have to go somewhere. That energy must move somewhere. And this is where the slave, the loser, develops something quite fascinating, which is psychological depth. Now, because he cannot express this desire, he's filled with attention. There's all this energy inside of him that want, he wants to bang Stacy. Let's be crude about it, you know? But he can't achieve that because he's not good enough. He's frail, weak, dork, nerd. So he's filled with this tension. This tension that was motivating him to go and get the girl is now stuck inside of him. And he is a big issue. So he'll have anxiety, he'll have all sorts of horrible feelings because like, getting pumped with this type of adrenaline that's trying to motivate you to go after the girl is not a good feeling at all. And he is getting confronted by his passions because what is happening here is his, his emotions, life inside of him is saying to him, get the girl. Life cares about, not about your ego, not about your feelings, not about you feeling good. Life cares about you achieving life's goals. And life's goals is for you to procreate with the most beautiful person possible so that she can continue her project of making better genetic specimens, basically. And when the nerd can't do that project, life begins to torture him. Life begins to shoot him full of electricity and say, why are you so shit? Why are you not good enough? What are you going to do about this? How, like, solve this problem, you know? We have to do this somehow. We have to figure something out. What's going on here? And so this energy starts to drive him mad. And so the nerd runs away into the corner. He runs, at, he runs home in front of his video games and all this, and he sits there pulling his hair out. And all these passions are just circling around in his head. And like a psychopath, he's thinking about Stacy. And he starts, to, he starts to get caught up in his mind thinking about the jock and Stacy together and all this type of stuff. And he has this whole fantasy experience and this internal psychological struggle happen inside of himself. 
Now this, of course, sucks, but it is not without its benefits. You see, Nietzsche is a brilliant, nuanced thinker, and he can see that there's nothing that's truly bad. Everything, if you are strong enough, can be turned to your advantage. So the master, the winner, the jock, has this effortless experience, and this comes with consequences. He can become a bit shallow, a bit naive. He can be a little bit out of touch. He's very impulsive and instinctive. But the loser doesn't have the natural beauty and virtues that the master has. He does not have the natural power and bravery required to get Stacy. Yet, because he gets shoved into this corner where he can't express his passions, because he's forced to confront these passions inside of his head and inside of his soul, he develops depth. He develops craftiness, creativity. He gets forced to introspect and understand himself. He gets forced to figure out a way to win despite the fact he's in a losing position. And this develops so many powerful virtues inside of the slave. You see, the jock has filled up the alpha male niche. If we were in the jungle, the jock would be the lion. He goes for the most straightforward apex predator way of winning. And his niche is to be the most dominant carnivore who can kill everybody and take the meat that he wants and all this stuff. But life is not binary like this. Life is not just going to look and say, well, the lion is the only thing that's allowed to exist. In fact, there is a phenomenal array of possibilities, of life strategies out in nature. There are worms that live underneath the ground and eat dirt. There are flies that fly around and lay their eggs in corpses. There's vultures that do similar things. There's rabbits, there's gazelles themselves. There's these plants. You know, there's all these tiny little viruses. There's parasites that live inside of other animals and stuff like this. There's mad fish that just swim around in the water. Like, I'll just have an everlasting bath or something like this. There's a lot of different ways that you can win in this game. Because the goal of life, obviously, is to make it forward into the next generation. Continue to evolve into a position of strength so you do not get killed by entropy. And life has many different possibilities of doing this. Now, the loser, in response to his situation can become inventive and try to figure out an alternate strategy. And life loves that. And Nietzsche points out that this is definitely a virtue. This creativity is not a bad thing at all. So reacting to the jock, the nerd has a lot of different choices. And it's a chance for him to get creative because he's going to be filled with all this negative emotion and he's going to have to figure out something to do. So the first response, the most heroic response, is where he can go from being a loser and transform into a winner. He can see that the jock has Stacy because he is the handsome athletic beast. And he can look at the jock and he can overcome his envy and interpret the emotional stress that he's going through well and say, you know what, I'm going to use this frustration to become like the jock, to compete with the jock. And I'm going to go up there alongside of him and either beat him or become again on his team or something like this. And so he might start showing up to the football games and start to go to the training and they'll, they'll bully him at first, but he'll just keep showing up like a soldier. He'll start eating his protein and all this type of stuff. And then one day they'll just accept him. He'll end up in the football team. He'll go to the parties and boom, he will get a gorgeous girlfriend and he will be happy. And life will reward him with pleasure for having the strength to overcome himself. That is one strategy. Now, he can also react in an even more interesting way, an even more creative way. That way that I just mentioned is heroic, is amazing. This is what we want to see inside of people. This is a rags to riches story, a man overcoming himself, someone overcoming their bitterness, their loserness, and their failures in order to become better. This is a self-improver's story par excellence, and it is good. But you can also do things much more devious and crafty. You see, the nerd's envy and resentment can get the better of him. And he can say, oh, I don't want to be like the alpha male and the jock. I don't want to have to turn into a football player. I want to do something else. I want to be myself, you fucking dork. He'll say something like this. Or he'll be a realist. He'll look and say, I'm a chin cell. I have little skinny shoulders. I'm frail and weak and pasty. My parents aren't going to buy me protein shakes. It's just not going to happen. So I have to realize that I'm never going to be an athlete. I cannot compete in that level, either out of resentment or realism. He realizes the situation. And so... He has to become creative. And he might notice something. Stacy is always listening to music. She's bopping with her music there all the time. Like, I don't know, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. Whatever it is Stacy's listening to. Whatever women are up to these days. I don't know. Listening to nonsense. So she's listening to this stuff. And he might think to himself, God fucking damn it. I like music as well. And I know how to play guitar. I'm a doomer. I'm a goth. I know how to play songs. I know how to use computers. I'm a nerd. So maybe I could make music. 
and then I could get inside of her head. I can be the kind of popular cool guy and you'll see all these musicians that she listens to and she loves them and she, she notices that she'll have like little posters up in her locker room of these, these weird pasty got guys that look just like him. And he'll say to himself, God fucking damn it. I can create myself into an alternate personality, an alternate strategy. I can become an artist. I can become a musician. And now you understand all artists are failed jocks. All of that higher art and creative culture that we treasure was made by losers who wanted Stacy's. And the thing is, this strategy works. Stacy's love pretty sounds. And so if you become the pretty sound making guy, you're gonna end up at the parties. You're gonna end up on the decks. You're gonna end up being the cool guy with the drugs, getting them blasted on cocaine on Saturday night. And that's going to lead to something. It's a way that you can win, where you don't have to be like the jock. And here the slave becomes king in a fascinating turn of fate. Now you can really see Nietzsche's point that failures definitely can have virtues. Failure is no reason to write yourself off. A slave is somebody with potential. Because when you're put into a bad position, you have an opportunity to be creative. You have an opportunity to react to what's happened to you and do something incredible. Nietzsche himself said that he measures the strength of a person on how bad of a position they can find themselves in and turn it to their advantage. That's a symbol of psychological vitality. How much different would your destiny be if you began to look at your problems a little bit like this? But creativity is fundamentally unstable. It is fundamentally chaotic. You see, what I've described is two heroic reactions to the problem of their emotions getting stunted as a loser. But you can also have unheroic reactions, reactions that many people would even describe as ugly. Say for example the nerd gets caught up in the tension of his passions, he's so frustrated, Stacy's so beautiful that he needs her, and he, he's too afraid to go to the football team, he can't play fucking guitar and stuff like this. All he's really good at is socialising, this is all he really understands, he understands people, he has this knack for this. And he's subtle, and he's, he's good at that game. He's always been good at that stuff. He's a little bit effeminate as well. So what he does is he hatches a plan. He needs to get rid of Chad. He needs to get Stacy, it's like a magic spell, to stop being in love with Chad, and that's a hard problem. So he realizes that when Chad goes out and plays football, Stacy goes into the library, and of course he goes to the library as well. And so when he's in the library, he sort of propositions to her, and he presents himself as this castrated male friend. You know, if feminized, I'm, or maybe I'm gay. Maybe he says I'm a gay guy or something like this. And he's innocuous. He's no sexual threat to her at all. None of that stuff. He kind of like jokes with her in a girly way. He says, oh, I listen to Barbie Girl as well, whatever it is. And then he goes and he, he gets beside Stacy and they do homework together. And he gets himself in her good books. And then when he's with Stacy, he begins to twist her mind. He begins to try to subvert the image of Chad, of the jock inside of her head. So he'll start to point out many of the things that we've noticed and emphasize them. Oh, the jock, those football players, they're kind of impulsive. They're very naive. They're kind of gruggish cavemen. They're not very intellectual like us. You know, we're sophisticated. We're the people reading the books. We're better than them, you know. We're socially savvy. We understand subtlety. We have these effeminate traits where we understand these things. We're crafty, creative. We've got all these types of things. We're devious little girls together, aren't we? Aren't we so? Those men, they're all just like dummies. Now, the Stacy will probably not listen to this. It probably won't take a deep root inside of her soul. Her instincts will override this most of the time. But it might start to chip away at her self-image, chip away at the image of Chad as this indomitable jock that nobody threatens. It might start to make him seem more like a funny figure inside of her head and stuff like this. And over time, she might begin to see him in a different way. She might begin to see some of his pathetic sides, his, his, his problematic sides. And then, of course, the friend will turn around and say, oh, I think I saw Chad, you know, talking to another girl the other day. I don't know. It's probably his friend or something like that. I don't want to suggest anything. But I don't know. He was like on his phone to some chick with brown hair and you blonde hair. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, Stacy starts to get all flustered. What's happening here? Now she feels threatened. Now she's kind of having doubts. Now she's in a confusing place. And of course, the male friend, the nerd, says, oh, well, she's crying. Well, maybe you should come over and talk to me. Maybe you should come to my house. Maybe we should hang out and we can talk about what you're going to do about Chad. And that's his chance to get in. 
Now, what the nerd has done here is quite a devious sin. He's realized the full power of his crafty genius, of his creative possibility. And he's reevaluated the image of the Chad inside of Stacy's mind. He, lusting for power, lusting for success, lusting for Stacy, has gone so far as to formulate a whole schema of lies, a whole worldview, a whole reframe of reality, a whole magic spell that he can cast on Stacy's mind to make him seem good and Chad seem bad. Now, this is a fascinating invention. Nietzsche called this the reevaluation of morals. You see, in the normal story about life, he is the loser, the jock is the winner, the jock is good, the jock is handsome, strong, athletic, instinctive, popular, and he is a loser, chin cell dork. But his genius and his desire for Stacy is so strong that he creates a whole alternate story that's completely fake, that's completely made up and out of touch with life, but because of the way human civilization works, this can survive, this can survive within the social game. And so he creates this story and he promulgates it into the mind of the Stacys. He reframes the Chad as impulsive, as silly, as dumb, as unthinking, as crooked and evil, and all of his virtues are bad. And of course, he paints all of what he is as something that is good. He is not a chin-cell loser nerd. He is a thoughtful, spiritual, savvy, socially cultured little man. He is a kind-hearted friend instead of a heartless jock. This is what you need to understand. This is how far nerds will go to fuck Stacy. They will lie about the entire nature of reality and they will turn it into all major religions on earth and enslave the jocks in their tyranny of mediocrity. And then there's one deeper level to this, the darkest level of all. Sometimes the nerd's strategies don't work. Sometimes he can't pull it off. Sometimes those urges make him frustrated, but he can't bewitch Stacy into getting into bed with him. He can't overcome Chad, and so his mind fills up with fantasies of vengeance because the passion never goes away. It stays inside of himself. It's impossible to crush that out of you unless you cut your testicles off. You start injecting yourself with hormones or something like this. You are trapped with these feelings being a part of life. You cannot deny life. Life is reality. So these feelings distort the nerd's mind. He starts pulling his hair out and he starts fantasizing about changing the nature of the school, about destroying Chad absolutely. He goes and he buys a gun. He buys the gun and he looks at it and he imagines one day he's going to walk in and he's going to get rid of them permanently. He will get his vengeance upon them. He will show them who is cool, who is strong. He will show them who has power. He will release that emotion. He could not release it as orgasm and as joy and as celebration alongside the jocks and the Stacy. So he will release it as vengeance. And so he walks in with a semi-automatic rifle and he marches through the school, finding every single Stacy and every single Chad and in their beauty, he destroys them. This is his final orgy of violence, his final release. And nobody can understand. Nobody can make sense of it. Has he gone crazy? Why is he doing it? Nobody can comprehend that he's so frustrated that he is not beautiful, that his only choice is to destroy what is beautiful. Oh yes, this is something that Nietzsche pointed out, that the failures, the losers, the nerds, and the weak, they are the greatest haters because their frustration can get so bent out of shape, get so distorted by their envy and resentment, that they will fantasize about the most incredible cruelty and madness in order to get their vengeance. So in conclusion, why would I say this is so important to understand? Well, I think this is an incredibly sophisticated schema for you to understand your emotions, because we all get resentful from times, we all lose at times. We often struggle to surrender to our passions and allow ourselves to win like Chad. To be a person is a complicated psychological project. And I look at this framework by Nietzsche and see great value in it. If you could show somebody who's struggling with frustration and resentment that they could transmute that heroically, I think that's a very important thing for the age we live in because we're saturated with last man, loser, nerd resentments. And it makes me wonder sometimes, was it a tragedy that Freud was chosen as the forefather of modern psychology? How much better would it have been if it was Nietzsche who was going to explain to us how to make sense of what we feel? Instead of going into the office of some Freudian pseudoscientist there to tell you that you're attracted to your own mother, you would have entered into the realm of a Nietzschean. That frustration you feel is the doorway to your highest potential. Here. 
take this prescription for anabolic steroids.